Hey guys, Cyclops here, and who knew I'm back with another computer video. Now, the purpose of this video is, uh, uh, well, I'm trying to get you guys that are on the consoles to maybe migrate to PC gaming, because the options I'm going to be showing today, for around $500, you can get a pretty kick-ass gaming system that rivals consoles. And not only that, uh, the bomb cost, the initial cost of the PC might be a little bit higher, but think about it. Steam is free. Like there's so many good games on. Like for every uh, <laughs> game that's on like Xbox One or PS4, rather, there are hundreds of them on Steam, and these don't cost a whole lot. So over, you know, a period of time, you're gonna recoup all that money back just by you know all the amazing deals that Steam has, or stuff like Humble Bundle or GOG, good old games. So. The options are, you know, it might be a little bit higher to start with, the, the price, but over time you're going to save a heck of a lot more. So, and the PCs, you know, it's, uh, consoles are generally just for gaming, you know, you could do media consumption and whatnot, but PCs are the master of, you know, multitasking, uh, multi-usage scenario machines, so you can never go wrong with those. For $500, I tried to fit in as much hardware as possible. I made some sacrifices here and there, but I think uh, they're well worth it for what you're going to get. So without further ado, let's go over the hardware that I've chose. Now, these, the, the stuff you see on the screens, are not necessarily what I'm going to be putting in the description, because I didn't have uh, you know, time to grab all everything from the description that I'm going to list. And plus, uh, plus, the prices are going to change over time, so they're always subject to change. So, uh, you know... This is just a basic guideline that I want you to follow if you want to get as much performance as possible, you know, for around $500 in a gaming PC. Now, I have to uh, stress this, this is a gaming PC. It's not going to be great for video editing, multimedia, like, uh, you know, uh, yeah, video editing, basically, video editing, rendering, stuff like that. Anything that requires a lot of cores and a lot of threads, I chose to go with the Intel because, well, Intel, uh, it's well regarded that Intel has much higher IPC than AMD, that's instruction per clock. So, let's say we have uh, two current gen AMD and Intel quad cores, let's say an i5 and uh, like a 40, FX4300 from AMD, they both have four cores. Well, AMD has two modules and four kind of threads, but we call it a quad core. Let's say we run them both at 4 gigahertz the Intel processor is going to be significantly faster because uh, even though they're running at the exact same frequency it can perform many more operations and tasks so that's called the IPC instructions per clock so uh, the reason why I went with Intel is uh, most games use one or two threads or cores so uh, there are a lot of games coming out or have been out like Battlefield 4 and Crisis 3 stuff like that that can actually leverage more cores but in reality, like the amount of money you spend extra on a quad core i5 or i7 toward what I have, which is a G3258 Segway. It's a Pentium Anniversary Edition. It's uh, it's special in the way that it's unlocked, so it's overclockable. It only has two cores, no hyper threading, no fancy AVX and AVX extensions and stuff like that. But for gaming, it's uh, you know you c you can't really beat it for the money. For the same money, you might be able to get a uh, AM2 Plus or AM2 uh, FX, uh, not FX, uh, for the exact 750 or 860 uh, APUs, which have the graphic portion disabled. So it's a quad core, but in games, this will perform a lot better. And uh, in multi threaded uh, applications, if again we're talking the same price point versus Intel and AMD, Intel beats it every time because that's that 70 to 75 dollar processor is really an amazing thing. Once you overclock it, it just it's amazing. So, uh, I'll, I mean, I, it's a lot of talk, but I'll show you guys the results. The other part is the motherboard. So, for this, uh, generally speaking, uh, Intel always had, uh, since the Sandy Bridge days, they locked the uh, overclocking on anything but their high-end motherboards uh, or chipsets like uh, currently Z87 and Z97. So, unless you have those, unless you do have those, you can't really overclock with any other boards. But with the advent of the Pentium anniversary, some motherboard manufacturers like MSI and Asus decided to unlock their lower end or lower tier boards. So, what you see in front of you is the H81 MP33. It's the cheapest motherboard I could find that support overclocking. 
this particular processor. Now, uh, it's only $50, it's not really going to rival or have features that are amazing and whatnot, but it's a great baseline and uh, this is where I managed to save most of the money by going with a cheap, cheap motherboard that's also overclockable, but not that expensive, and it's decent. Around $50, $45 US, uh, $50 Canadian. Uh, so uh, for you Euro guys out there, I'm sure you can find these, but it's probably going to be a little bit more expensive for you since you know you have VAT value added tax and then you got some import taxes and stuff. Generally speaking, North American prices are a lot lower than Europe, so uh, there's that. The, 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 everything I include in this belt, it's around $515, $512, something like that Canadian. $460, $470 US, so you decide, um, uh, yeah, you decide how much value you can get out of it. So we're going to overclock that processor, 3.2 GHz base clock, I'm probably going to be able to get it to 4, anywhere from 4 to 4.5 with the stock heatsink. Now, stock heatsinks on these are not that great, uh, but they get the job done, not that quiet, the thermal dissipation isn't that great, but they get the job done for stock frequencies overclocking might be a little bit ask, you know, too much to ask for it but it's a dual core doesn't kick out much heat and uh, we're going to be deleting the processor to even improve to, to further improve the thermal dissipation properties of the processor and the heatsink so if you have 25 30 dollars extra just throw it in a grab another heatsink something like the cooler master 212 plus or the hyper 212 plus or hyper 212 evo those are great coolers for the money and they will perform far better than this but I uh, just want to save as much money as possible, so I went with that option. Um, we'll, we'll see how effective it is. I mean, I do have a lot of coolers lying around, I can just change it. But I just wanted to see, as an exercise, how far we can push it, knowing that uh, these processors don't give out a lot of heat and the Intel Orb cooler isn't that great. But we'll see. We'll see. Power supply. So for this belt, uh, 500 watts is more than enough considering the graphic card we're going to be using. Uh, the thing is, not every 500 watt power supply is the same. The particular one you see is an EBG 500 watt, which is 80 plus. It's just 80 plus, uh, not, not, no bronze or anything. Uh, it's a good uh, good power supply, reliable, has two 8 plus 2 pins uh, for a PCIe Express connector. So, you know, if you have a beefy power supply, I guarantee you with the combination we have, even if you chuck a 290X or a 780 Ti in there, it'll work fine. It's kind of crazy to spend 500 to 700 bucks on a graphic and 75 dollars on the processor but you have the option if you choose to go that way so uh, the power supply is plenty of enough plenty enough the, the thing i'm going to list in the description is going to be around 40 bucks is from uh, cool max it's a 500 watt unit 80 plus as well it's about five to ten bucks cheaper it's not as nice looking and the cables done all of them are not braided but you know it'll get the job done generally you want to go with 80 plus uh, at least that generally means that the internal components are somewhat reliable and efficient so it's okay uh, if you got more money we want to spend on the power supply is enough but that 500 watt even when you overclock the processor we're looking at 100 watts maximum under load 100 to 120 the graphic card you see there let's segue to that they'll use a bit more that's a GTX 460 that's not what's in the description what's in the description is an MSI GTX 650 Ti so a one gigabyte so that one is around the uh, stock performance they're around the same performance the 460 is a little bit better obviously the power consumption of thermals are a lot better but uh, again I didn't want to buy the extra stuff and wait for it to arrive so I just went with what I had that's a used 460 you can't find them new anymore but that's a baseline uh, representation of uh, what you might expect out of performance of uh, you know 650 Ti so it's overclocked a little bit we'll see the results I'm gonna compare it with the high-end system later on we have that uh, together in gaming scenarios with 80 plus power supply you're looking at 250 to 350 probably 250 to 300 watt uh, maybe even less power consumption uh, under you know really heavy load uh, heavy gaming load so synthetics obviously will kick up higher but you, you wouldn't want to want to, I mean why would you compare the power consumption with synthetic tests when you know most of the time you're going to be gaming uh, anyway, so yeah, there's that. Again, the everything you see here, apart from the graphic card, costs about three hundred and ninety dollars. So I want you to get the three hundred ninety dollar package as a baseline, and then spend whatever money you have left on the best graphic card that you can possibly get. So it doesn't have to be Nvidia. We can get something like R9 or R7, two sixty five or uh, two sixty even. 
maybe if you can switch to a 270X, which is the exact same as the HD7870. Again, it depends on the budget. So 390 bucks for the baseline and then whatever you got left on the budget on the graphic card, that's my recommendation. So for the storage, it's also debatable. I went with 120 gig SSD, Kingston V300 uh, SSD now, which is a pretty good, it's not the fastest, but it's a pretty good SSD. Uh, it's uh, 128, 120 gigs for $60, and with another $55, I managed to fit in a one terabyte Seagate Barracuda drive. So $115 uh, for storage. I looked around on Newegg, again, subject to change, all the pricing and availability. And uh, for $150, you can get a 240 gig Mushkin Kronos Enhanced SSD. That was the cheapest I could find. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's your choice. Do you want 240 gig of very fast storage or you want 120 gig of very fast storage plus one terabyte of relatively slow mechanical storage? So, uh, the 120 gig and I think uh, uh, the, the one terabyte is a better option, but if you play a lot of games, like especially games these like Battlefield 3 with premium and uh, what was that game? Titanfall. They're like 50 gig installation each. So, you know, spend it toward an SSD if you want. I'm going to include both options in the description so you'll see. Memory is pretty generic. I don't even have a matched set there. You just uh, these uh, the motherboard, the H81 uh, M's and H91 stuff like that. They don't support anything over 1333. So don't go blow your money on a 2800 megahertz kit or something. It's DDR3 obviously, but uh, yeah, memory performance uh, doesn't really affect gaming performance at all. Like uh, the difference between a 1333 kit and 2400 megahertz kit maybe one or two FPS in a in, in a game, like uh, there's some games that love memory performance such as uh, F1 2012, but you know, that's just one game out of a thousand that you're really gonna see performance improvement out of uh, really fast memory, so you don't really have to worry about it, 1333 is fine, this motherboard actually supports all the way to 1400 megahertz, so it's a, it's, it's a little bit better. There it is, so find the cheapest 8 gig kit you can find, that's my recommendation, you can either go with two 4 gigabyte sticks or a single 1 gigabyte sticks. The advantage of a single gigabyte stick is that you can add another stick later and get 16 gigs because the motherboard obviously only ha supports two slots for uh, DDR3 memory. Or you can, uh, right off the bat, you get two 4 gigabyte sticks, go dual channel, double the memory bandwidth so you get some of the performance loss back and it's there but you won't be able to upgrade unless you replace both sticks. So it's up to you. My recommendation get two 4 gig sticks or whatever is cheaper. It's around 80, whatever stick you can find, like G-Scale is my favorite, uh, Corsair uh, and Kingston, they're decent too, Crucial, try to stay away from Crucial, the warranty, especially for Canada, sucks horribly, like I've bought uh, a couple of memory from someone and uh, they didn't work so I sent, it, it was a hassle, so they charged me for sh shipping and on the return uh, uh, and customs, customs charge me, so which is something they never do with anyone. I don't know if they fix that, but again, I'm trying to stay away from crucial. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much all that uh, all that there is. Uh, memory, pretty generic. Uh, to find the cheapest eight gig uh, uh, kit that you can or stick. Uh, for case, pretty flexible option. Again, it's up to you what you want to choose. Uh, what I chose here was what I had available. It's a Zalman ZMT1. It's a pretty curious case. Uh, it's taller than it is longer and you can fit a H100 in the roof so <laughs> it's kinda cool also supports two three and a half inch drives and a single two and a half inch drive supports long graphics cards and it's pretty good uh, it, it's a bit unorthodox in the way it, it's built there are other options available uh, the one I'm gonna include in the uh, description is gonna be a Cougar uh, I forgot what it's called uh, let me check just give me a second it's called the uh, Cougar Spike Black Gaming Case. So it's about $35, same price as this. Internals are uh, completely black, has uh, basic but decent cable management, has plenty of room inside. It looks a little bit tacky, but it's alright. For 40, 35 bucks, you'd be hard pressed to find something else uh, that's better. So in, any choice, really. The case is also your choice if you want to go. This is a micro ATX, obviously, so because uh, the motherboard is micro ATX. If you want to go with something a little bit bigger, like ATX, you can do that, but then it's going to be more expensive. So we have the case. Again, you have the option of choosing whatever you want or whatever is on sale. Prices are subject to change. Availability is subject to change. So grab them while you can. I'm just trying to give you a baseline. Other than that, uh, yeah, that's pretty much the parts that we're going to start with. So. Uh, like I mentioned, we're going to be dealing the processor and doing as much as we can to alleviate the heat 
uh, problem that these processors uh, usually have. Like the new i7 and i5s, the uh, Devil's Canyon don't have this. You don't really have to delete them. Obviously, you can drop the temperatures a bit more, but uh, for low end stuff, they didn't bother changing the thermal pace. So, uh, or reducing the gap, which is what is commonly known to cause the heat overheating issue. So, without further ado, uh, let let me go and uh, start with the, the processor deloading. So, what I'm going to do is basically uh, move the camera come close to nice and personal and we're going to deal with the processor and do all the things that's necessary to uh, improve thermals, put it on the motherboard and then we're going to test see how it turns out. So I'll see you in the next part guys.